Violent crime in Mount Vernon has people on edge. Said, give me all the money in your register, and then got out a gun. New tonight, residents speak out on how this is affecting their daily lives. City Hall finalizing how they'll spend your tax dollars. We have team coverage on the funding going towards your safety and the questions left unanswered. Plus, how millions more than expected going into education could affect your wallet. Our Marylanders are going to be more safe and feel more safe than they were before this plan was implemented. We examine if the governor's new crime plan matches what voters have been asking for. Chances for much needed rain throughout the week. I'm breaking down the day-by-day -day impact in your area. Live from WBFF in Baltimore, this is Fox 45 News at 10. The Baltimore City budget now has the mayor's signature finalized four days ahead of schedule. Good evening, everybody. I'm Mary Bubala. I'm Maxine Stryker. It comes weeks of after hearings and sometimes heated debate. For the first time, city council had a say in where the money went, and they reallocated nearly $12 million of the proposed budget. Well, the budget totals $4.4 billion. It includes $5 million for the fire department to buy new equipment and $2 million to improve city surveillance. It's also giving $800,000 for programming in rec centers and more than $12 million set aside for community violence intervention. Part of that money will go to safe streets. The budget includes record investments for the Baltimore City Public School System, more than $405 million, including nearly $80 million for the Kerwin Education Plan. Fox 45 News is following the money. Jeff Abel is looking into some of those big ticket items, including the money for the current plan and the impact it could have on your wallet. Our team coverage begins with Mackenzie Frost and the questions we still have about the Safe Streets program as the city invests more tax dollars. Going into the budget hearings, there were several questions about how the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement was using its funding. Some of those questions from the council were similar to ones we've been asking for over a year. Despite the budget now being signed, some of those questions remain unanswered. Safe Streets is Baltimore's flagship gun violence prevention program. The efforts have Mayor Brennan Scott's full support. We want safe streets when we want them. And the backing of millions of your tax dollars. The Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement, or MONZI, led by Shante Jackson, defending the budget request before the council. Good evening, Chair Costello, members of the committee. Getting $12.1 million for Safe Streets, the Group Violence Reduction Strategy, and other efforts. While Fox 45 News learning the job descriptions for the agency's now 45-member staff, thanks to this response to Councilman Eric Costello's budgeting demand letter, there are still several unanswered questions about how the city agency itself operates. On June 19th, Fox 45 News sent Monzi and Mayor Scott's office several questions, including what are the qualifications each employee has to justify holding their respective role? What is their previous employment? Will you allow Fox 45 News to interview any or all Monzi employees to learn more about their work? Have any of the individuals listed on the chart been convicted of misdemeanors or felonies? If so, who and what were the convictions? Those questions ignored by leaders inside City Hall. Fox 45 News previously hearing from family members concerned about the direction of safe streets. Like Charles Goods, whose son, Damon Scroggins, was looking to start a new life chapter. He had said with me probably about a couple weeks before he was murdered. Um, that he was looking to be hired by Safe Streets. Mm -hmm. Has your view of the Safe Streets program changed throughout this? Absolutely. Week? Oh, yes. Yes. My belief is that our city government is financing a criminal enterprise. Meanwhile, the Safe Streets program continues to operate, getting an infusion of one-time cash from the Federal American Rescue Plan money. That's on top of the funding already going to Safe Streets. We've been digging into the program for nearly two years, going door to door, looking for information about how the violence interrupters do their job. Director Jackson refusing an interview with us to discuss safe streets. Now, another budget signed. More effort and money poured into a program with little accountability parameters in place and mixed performance records. Another thing to watch, the Board of Estimates is set to approve a second no-cost extension for a nonprofit operating one of the Safe Streets locations. The same nonprofit that was supposed to wrap up management 
months ago. So as we continue to dig into safe streets, we do get some answers, but we uncover even more questions and our investigation isn't over. In the newsroom, Mackenzie Frost, Fox 45 News. Well, as we mentioned, the budget includes about $79 million for the blueprint for Maryland's future, also known as the Kerwin Plan. That's $67 million more than the city had planned on. The mayor announced the increase when he announced his budget proposal back in April. It was a gut punch, what we've been discussing with. defending his son during an interview last month. My son has done nothing wrong. I trust him. I have faith in him. The tax and gun charges giving additional validity to the contents of the infamous Hunter Biden laptop, despite initial efforts by intelligence officials to discredit the laptop as disinformation. There were also emails from the laptop that were included in the evidence. In other words, the Department of Justice admitted pretty early on that the laptop was genuine and these emails were genuine. Much of the money Hunter failed to pay taxes on came from the Ukrainian energy company Burisma. These payments at the center of the House Oversight Committee's probe into the Biden family finances, an investigation Republicans say they're determined to continue. In Washington, I'm Kayla Gaskins. Republican Congressman Jim Comer doubles down on his belief that President Biden and his son Hunter took massive bribes from a Ukrainian energy company executive. He calls the unproven allegation a money laundering scheme. Comer wants to know why the media isn't hitting the story harder. His Democratic colleague, Maryland Congressman Jamie Raskin, says Comer is on the scent of nothing. But do you not have a little curiosity as to what the Biden family did to receive all this money. Are you not the least bit curious? You know, my colleagues have been barking up the wrong tree. And, uh, you know, we're, we're on a wild goose chase, and I hope it can end so we can get back to work uh, at more serious things. Well, taking a live look at the Capitol now, where Republicans are arranging to speak with a former business partner of Hunter Biden's to see if he has any more information. The news comes one day before special counsel John Durham is expected to testify publicly before the House Judiciary Committee tomorrow about his report on the FBI's investigation of alleged ties between Russia and Donald Trump's 2016 presidential campaign. He was part of a closed-door session today on Capitol Hill. We'll have more on that coming up in 10 minutes. A federal prosecutor working on the Hunter Biden case has also made headlines here in Baltimore. Leo Wise had been the lead prosecutor on the case against former Baltimore City State's attorney Marilyn Mosby before he was demoted earlier this year. Wise also played a role in the case against the Gun Trace Task Force and the case against former Mayor Catherine Pugh. We want you to join the national conversation. Will the ongoing investigation of Hunter Biden impact your vote in 2024? To join, just take out your phone, open the camera, and point it at the QR code you see on your screen. We had a pretty nice and mostly dry day today, and the past few days have been dry, but we're getting ready for a rainy pattern. This will help to improve drought conditions. I'll let you know how much rain we could see coming up in my full forecast. Back to you. Jasmine, thank you. Well, coming up on Fox 45 News at 10, Fox 45 News is hearing from residents of Baltimore's Mount Vernon neighborhood saying crime is changing their way of life. A closer look at the numbers and the impact of so-called quality of life crime. A new survey ranks Baltimore among the worst run cities in America, where the city falls when it comes to crime and graduation rates and the criticism for city leaders. And then still ahead, Fox 45 News continues to analyze Governor Westmore's crime plan, how it compares to what voters have been asking for.
Baltimore Police tell Fox 45 News they're looking for multiple suspects in Friday's mass shooting. They say the suspects pulled up to the intersection of Cold Spring Avenue and York Road in an SUV, and at least one of the suspects got out and opened fire on people standing at that bus stop. The community held a meeting today where they expressed concerns about policing, asking for a more hands-on approach. They're also asking for more help from city leaders. Councilman Mark Conway vowing to talk with BPD about having a stronger presence. The community saying it, I think it's a conversation we need to have. And the councilman, I really respect and appreciate him, but he needs to tell us what programs, what finances are available for us to be able to make the difference that we need to make. As for the investigation into the shooting, police have not given any more details when it comes to a suspect description and have not released a motive. We're turning now to the Central District in the Mount Vernon neighborhood. Fox 45 News is hearing from residents who say they don't feel safe after we heard from a grocery store owner who says the crime is forcing him to close his business. Fox 45's Keith Daniels spoke with residents about their concerns and takes a closer look at those numbers tonight. Keith? Well, Maxine, some of the people we talked to say they have no real concerns about their safety in their community, while others say there is a deeper concern. But tonight, a closer look from one resident from a personal point of view. It surprises me. For Jim Buckingham, there's a list. Car break-ins, muggings, just petty theft. His concern over crime budding at the business where he works, the flower shop on Eager Street in Mount Vernon. When I moved to Mount Vernon, I moved here because I thought it was a safe neighborhood. And I haven't personally seen a lot of it, but every time I hear about it, I'm so surprised that it happens because it's such a cute neighborhood. According to recent data from police, while overall crime in the Central District, which includes Mount Vernon, is down 17% as of May this year, property crimes are up 12%, with larceny, theft of personal property, up 30% as of May 2023, compared to the same time last year. It's disappointing because it makes you not feel safe or comfortable in your neighborhood. A look at crime numbers in the community comes as a neighborhood landmark prepares to shut down. Eddie's across the street from the flower shop set to close permanently at the end of the month. The owner telling Fox 45 News Monday crime is a driving force behind his decision to close his business. We had two knives pulled on us in the last year trying to stop shoplifters and I don't want to I don't want to expose my family nor my employees to that. Buckingham recalls when a thief struck at his flower shop four years ago. Said, give me all the money in your register and then got out a gun. Surveillance cameras captured images of the suspect who put a gun to the owner's back, then forced the 77-year-old owner and another staffer into a rear closet. I was petrified. I was never so frightened in my life. The thief got away, hopped a city bus with two purses and money from the cash drawer. Chilling moments in the historic community with concerns about crime then and now. That's always so scary because I never expect it to happen in Mount Vernon. Well, Buckingham says part of what he does to help keep safe when he's out walking about is travel in numbers. He says there's, or rather travel in a group. He says there's safety in numbers. Well, live now in Mount Vernon, Keith Daniels, Fox 45 News. Keith, thank you. Well, a new survey from Wallet Hub ranks Baltimore among the worst run cities in America. It ranks 132 on a list of 149 cities. The research examined several factors, including education and safety. The survey lists Baltimore as tied for the highest, highest violent crime right with Memphis, St. Louis, Detroit, Little Rock, Arkansas on that list as well. Baltimore is ranked 146 for graduation rates, the third lowest on that list. The low ranking comes as the school system spends more than most schools in the country, about $21,000 per student. Activists say city and school leaders are to blame. It's not surprising, and it's really sad that the lawmakers and the folks who have power to make true change are not doing so because of politics. It's hard not to scratch your head and think that some corruption is happening when you see that each student is given $21,000, but they're not graduating from high school. 
Nationally known civil rights attorney Ben Crump is part of a lawsuit against Baltimore City Schools, arguing the city is misusing tax dollars because students aren't getting the education they deserve. Last week, the Maryland NAACP held a two-day conference trying to find solutions to low-performing schools, especially in Baltimore City. You can find more on both topics on our website, foxbaltimore.com. New information following Saturday's MTA bus crash in Baltimore. Clarification on how many people were involved and who's still receiving treatment. I'm Christine Frizzow on Capitol Hill, where the public will hear for the first time from former special counsel John Durham about the ins and outs of his explosive investigation. We are getting ready for our next weather maker, and that will bring much needed rain to the state. The showers start for some areas tonight, but then tomorrow we have the chance for scattered showers and potential storms as that low pressure system lifts north. I'll let you know how much rain we could see coming up in my weather authority forecast. How and why did America's top law enforcement agency launch an investigation into President Trump on the 2016 election and Russia? Former special counsel John Durham was on Capitol Hill today telling lawmakers behind closed doors. Tomorrow he's going to testify on the matter publicly. National correspondent Christine Frizzau reports. After a four-year investigation, John Durham concluded that the probe, known as Crossfire Hurricane, never should have happened. His 300-page report detailing missteps, miscommunications, and mishandling of uncorroborated information that came in part from Hillary Clinton's campaign, combined with, quote, confirmation bias, where people at the FBI accepted information and evidence that is consistent with what they believe to be true, while ignoring or rejecting information that challenges those beliefs. The FBI failed to uphold their mission of strict fidelity to the law. Republicans say the report proved their longtime claims of a two-tiered system of justice, which didn't treat allegations about Hillary Clinton or Hunter Biden in the same way. They didn't prosecute, they didn't go after these folks in all of these other instances, but in the one 
you go after President Trump. While the system within the FBI has already drastically changed, according to Director Chris Wray, top Republicans hoping Durham's testimony this week will help prevent future such investigations they have deemed politically motivated. When your government's lying to you, when your government is telling you that something has happened that has not happened, that's when our committee has to be involved. That notion central to former President Trump's defense in his current legal troubles over his mishandling of classified documents. This was a weaponization of politics. This was a weaponization of the White House. His former attorney general adamant he and those defending him are wrong in this case. Their basic argument really isn't to defend his conduct because Trump's conduct is indefensible. What they're really saying is he should get a pass because Hillary Clinton got a pass six or seven years ago. If you want to restore the rule of law and equal justice, you don't do it by further derogating from justice. John Durham is set to testify publicly before the House Judiciary Committee Wednesday, where GOP lawmakers plan to push him on why officials accused of wrongdoing weren't charged, why certain pieces of evidence were prioritized and others ignored. While Democrats are expected to make the case, it was all old news and a waste of taxpayer dollars. In Washington, I'm Christine Frazow. Ahead at 1030, Governor Westmore's crime plan met with its share of critics. Fox 45 News takes voter concerns about specifics to the governor's office. And only about 36 hours left to save the crew of a missing passenger sub before their air supply runs out. The efforts to find them. We're following three big stories at 1030. The clock is ticking for crews to find a missing submersible with five people on board. The latest on the search and when the vessel could run out of oxygen. Maryland is on a growing list of government employers no longer requiring a college degree to fill open jobs. Why the move has college students concerned. Crime continues to impact families all over Maryland. Now Governor Moore is trying to get a grip on the crisis. And we begin there. Fox 45 News is analyzing the governor's crime plan from every angle. Fox 45's Mackenzie Frost has a look at how the plan compares to what voters have been asking for. 
Governor Moore's three-pronged approach has some broad ideas, but one specific thing that several Maryland voters seem to be looking for when it comes to public safety policy seems to be going ignored. And right now, the crime crisis continues. From Baltimore and beyond, crime continues to hold a grip on the state of Maryland. It's something Governor Wes Moore is well aware of, though he points to his predecessor as part of the reason. The surge in violence that we're seeing right now it's not new. It is something that we inherited. Governor Moore out with a three-pronged approach. Tackling the violence, ripping families and communities apart for nearly a decade in Baltimore alone. Investment in education, law enforcement, and collaboration with local leaders, all in an attempt to address the root causes of crime. I don't think anybody argues with what is being laid out. The question becomes, what's the detail? Rob Weidhold, a crisis communication expert and former Baltimore police officer on Fox 45 Morning News, saying people don't care about plans, they care about results. Because at the end of the day, plans, I always say policy, policy papers, whatever it might be, are just that. Uh, the proof is in the pudding, and our Marylanders are going to be more safe and feel more safe than they were before this plan was implemented. Results that right now aren't being felt in every community. <laughs> Given the lack of specifics in the crime plan from the governor, Fox 45 News emailing his office asking, why not announce specific plans for immediate impact in communities? No response. While the governor is talking about doing things differently under his administration, some things appear to be the same. During the last legislative session, a Republican-backed plan to make the theft of a firearm a felony failing to pass. The same plan that's been introduced in the House since 2018. The latest Gonzalez poll showing nearly 90% of Marylanders support that idea. House Minority Leader Jason Buckle writing his caucus, quote, will continue to fight for sensible policies to keep our community safe. Fox 45 News also asking Governor Moore's office, does the governor agree with the poll results that the theft of a firearm should be a felony? If so, why not support the legislation? Again, no answer. Governor Moore often heard saying, Public safety is my number one priority as governor. So our final question for him Tuesday, should there be an emergency legislative session to enact plans targeting crime now? Questions ignored by the governor's team. With homicides and non-fatal shootings scarring families forever and more young people finding themselves involved in violence, many Marylanders don't have time for party politics and they want a safer state today. Without an emergency legislative session, any hope for policy change would likely come next year when lawmakers return to Annapolis. In the newsroom, Mackenzie Frost, Fox 45 News. Well, Fox 45 News has done extensive reporting on the governor's new crime plan. You can find all of our coverage on our website, foxbaltimore.com. We're learning more about Saturday's MTA bus crash in Baltimore that left 17 people hurt. Officials say one person is still in the hospital, but all others have been released. Officials say the bus crashed into another car Saturday morning along Packa Street near West Mulberry Street. The bus then crashed into an apartment building. The first floor of the apartment building was evacuated for a short time. Authorities are still investigating the cause of the crash. Some new details about the sudden resignation of Bill Doyle, the director of the Maryland Port Administration, stepped down on Friday, three days after he was cited in a crash. Well, we have learned he was driving a state-issued vehicle when that crash happened on I-83 last Wednesday in Baltimore. His car hit another vehicle, causing a chain reaction involving two other cars. As we told you yesterday, he received three citations, including leaving the scene of the crash. He did return to the site after he was contacted by state police. Now, our Mackenzie Frost has also confirmed that Doyle has been selected to be the new CEO of the Dredging Contractors of America. One advocate is calling 2023 a record year for school choice. Eight states have passed school choice measures so far this year, including Florida, Arkansas, and Iowa. Families there will now be able to use at least some of their tax dollars to send their children to schools beside their assigned public schools. Angela Morabito of the Defense of Freedom Institute is crediting parents for the momentum. Parental demand is the driving force behind school choice. We're seeing parents uh, from all walks of life who are united by the fact that they want options for their kids. The Texas legislature is expected to soon enter a special session to continue discussing its own school choice bill.
During the last legislative session, lawmakers voted to continue to fund the Boost program, giving some Maryland families school choice. That program provides scholarships to low-income families, allowing them to attend parochial and other non-public schools. Supporters say the program is necessary, considering many city public schools are struggling. Earlier this year, Project Baltimore found 23 schools where zero students among those tested are proficient in math. Critics argued public funds shouldn't go to private schools. You can find more on the Boost program on our website right now at foxbaltimore.com. The list is growing of government and corporate employers dropping the college degree requirement to fill open jobs. Maryland is on that list. It is a move drawing criticism and concern from some college students. The National Desk's Angela Brown has the story. Virginia's Republican Governor Glenn Youngkin making Virginia the latest state ending the college degree requirement for close to 90 percent of state jobs. Following in the footsteps of Maryland's Republican governor at the time, Larry Hogan, and Pennsylvania's Democratic governor, Josh Shapiro, who on his first day in office removed the college degree requirement for nearly 65,000 jobs, a move he says will remove barriers of opportunity. You would be judged on your merits, your ability to do the job, maybe the practical work experience or the apprenticeship program you went through instead. But some college students are not buying it, pointing the finger instead at universities and what they consider indoctrination on college campuses. Emily Sturge from Campus Reform explains. Yes, I think so, because students are graduating college proficient in woke ideals like DEI and LGBTQ, but not proficient in the skills necessary for the job market. But the numbers tell a different story. The Bureau of Labor Statistics is reporting over 10 million open jobs. Employers are having a tough time hiring and also retaining workers. Tracy Burns, CEO of the Northeast HR Association, says the pandemic was the catalyst for states and companies dropping the degree requirement. Employers are realizing that there isn't necessarily a, a direct correlation between the success of their candidates and then employees and a college degree. A growing list of major companies like Google, Delta and IBM also dropping the college degree requirement for some positions. In Washington, D.C., I'm Angela Brown. Crews are racing to find a missing submersible with five people on board before their oxygen supply runs out. That sub went missing on Sunday during a trip to see the wreckage of the Titanic. It had a 96-hour oxygen supply when it was put out to sea around 6 Sunday morning. That means it could run out of air by Thursday morning. So far, the search has covered 10,000 square miles, but there's no sign of the lost sub. We're, we're, you know, you're talking about a search area that's 900 miles east of Cape Cod, uh, 400 miles um, south of uh, St. John's. So logistically speaking, it's hard to bring assets to bear. It takes time. It takes coordination. Um, and then we're dealing with, uh, you know, two pieces of you're dealing with a surface search and a subsurface search. And frankly, that makes it an incredibly complex operation. Jackie Kent with our Sinclair sister station in Washington has the details of the search. The search is on for a missing expedition sub carrying five people to explore the wreckage of the Titanic. The vessel built by Everett Company Ocean Gate Expeditions. It's terrifying. I'm worried. I just heard about it just now. I mean, I hear about Ocean Gate all the time and all their work that they do. The Coast Guard explained the U.S. and Canadian assets aiding in the search about 900 miles east of Cape Cod. We want to make sure that we have done absolutely everything that we can do to uh, locate uh, their family members and bring them home safe. Those include C-130 aircraft for aerial visuals, plus sonar buoys capable of listening to a depth of 13,000 feet. So we've been in touch with additional commercial vessels that are operating in the area. Como News in 2018 covered when Everett-based Ocean Gate Expeditions finished building the Titan vessel, the same type of sub now missing. It was touted as the only five crew member vessel that could reach Titanic depths at nearly 4,000 meters. The annual expedition started in 2021 with the goal to document the wreckage and the impact on the surrounding environment. A retired UK Navy Rear Admiral explains the possible reasons the sub lost communication less than two hours into the launch. Either lost an umbilical communication with the surface uh, or indeed uh, there's been a malfunction uh, and the submarine is continuing to operate but obviously out of contact with its mothership. OceanGate in a statement says it's deeply thankful for the assistance to reestablish contact with their sub. 
The five people on board include one pilot or operator and four civilians who paid to go on this expedition with local company Ocean Gate. Right now, officials are not releasing their names because they are still working to notify families. For now, I'm Jackie Kent reporting for the National Desk, America's News Now. Well, the governor of Pennsylvania says traffic will once again be flowing on I-95 this weekend, more than a week after a section of the interstate collapsed in Philadelphia. Governor Josh Shapiro says temporary lanes will open with permanent repairs to follow. The stretch before it was damaged saw 160,000 commuters each and every day. Shapiro heaped praise on the crews working around the clock to get those repairs done ahead of schedule. Think about this. In nine days, these folks behind me here have completed the demo, built the entire structure for the interim roadway, and begun installing these barriers. A section of the northbound lanes of the elevated highway collapsed last week after a tractor trailer carrying gasoline crashed and caught fire. The northbound lanes collapsed and the southbound lanes were so damaged they had to be demolished as well. Well, coming up, you may be paying more for vacation just because you're American. Why there is a price difference and how you can outsmart the system. Ahead on the late edition, an eye in the sky for rescue crews. How drones are helping first responders navigate dangerous floodwaters in the deep south. And tomorrow we are getting ready for the first day of summer, but it won't feel like it with high temperatures only in the mid 70s. We'll also have the next chance for rain. I'll break down the timing and how much to expect in my weather authority forecast.